So I'm, I'm warning you now, because Nick finished 10 minutes early, I have license to run over by 10 minutes. <laughs> you think I'm joking. <laughs> No, I promise the last 10 minutes will be incomprehensible, so you can just sleep anyway. That's fine. <laughs> um, so the goal today is to ju just synthesize everything I've been doing with, with everything Nick's been doing and, and stick it together and, and get a nice theorem and see some consequences. Um, so let me just remind you what, what I did yesterday. Um, I considered two different spaces, uh, one of which is the total space of a line bundle, O minus D over PN minus 1. And the other one is an orbifold, CN mod ZD. Um, and these two guys, you should think of as being birational to each other, even though one of them is an orbifold. Um, and using windows, we proved that their derived categories are very closely related. And the relationship depends on, on the numbers n and d. So the statement was that um, if d is less than n, um, then the derived category of the orbifold, which just means the equivariant, the zd equivariant derived category of cn, uh, that should embed into the derived category of x plus. And if the inequality goes the other way, then the embedding goes the other way. Um, and if they're actually equal, then you, what you have there is an equivalence. Um, and d equals n is exactly the case where these spaces are kalabi yau. So it's the case where x plus is kalabi yau, it's a non-compact variety. It's also the case where x minus is kalabi hours and orbifold, because what it says is that zd is acting with trivial determinant on cn. Right? That's the case d equals n. Um, have I got my arrows the right way around? I think so. Uh, and these embeddings are as admissible subcategories. Right? Left and right admissible subcategories. Um, and something I didn't prove, but was kind of in the exercises is that the orthogonal to these embeddings is something very straightforward that has a, a exceptional collection, a full exceptional collection. So um, you should really think that, you know, this thing is given by an interesting piece, which is the derived category of the other space, and then some not very interesting, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Not to be rude about Sasha's lectures, but categories with exceptional collections are, are relatively straightforward. <laughs> Compared to other categories, right? Um, but so some piece over here which has, has, a, uh, has, a, has a full exceptional collection. Okay. So these categories are very closely related, right? They're sort of equal up to some relatively straightforward pieces. That's the idea. Um, so, what I want to do now, aha, uh -huh, you were out of the room when I was being rude about you. <laughs> I'll be nice about you in a minute. Um, what I want to talk about now is, is going from here um, to a Landau Ginzburg model and upgrading from um, derived categories to matrix factorizations, right? So adding on a superpotential. So everything I'm going to say is going to work, you know, for all the examples that we've done with these different possible quotients, um, you could do it for any of them, but I'm, I th I'm just going to do it for this specific example, because that's the one I want to use. But nothing changes if you want to do it to one of the other examples. Um, so let me, let me set up um, the quotient problem again. Um, so what did we do? We took C star acting on C n plus 1. Um, and the weights had to be 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 minus D. Um, and cutting out two different loci, got, that gave us our x plus and x minus, right? Um, now, I want to make this into a Landau-Ginzburg model. 
So if I'm going to be careful, I need to have the R charge as well. So I'm not going to say much about this, but Nick did it in his lectures. The R charges of these coordinates should be 0, 0, 0, and then 2 at the end. Okay, this is exactly the example that Nick wrote down. Um, and to continue with what Nick wrote, I want to put a super potential on this guy. So I need to write down a function on this, but it had better be invariant under C star. So how do you do that? You pick f of x. So these first variables, these are x, right? And this last variable is p. So you pick f, a polynomial in x of degree d, and then your superpotential is just f times p. And that has weight 0, so it's invariant under C star action, and it also has R charge 2, which is necessary. Um, so then you can think, if you like, um, that Cn plus 1 with this W is a sort of stacky version of a Landau-Ginzburg model, or if you like, it's just sort of some equivariant version of a Landau-Ginzburg model, right? It's a Landau-Ginzburg model which has a C star acting on it. Um, preserving, preserving everything you need. Okay. Um, you can also take W and restrict it to the open sets x plus and x minus, and it becomes a function on those open sets, right? Or it becomes a function on those actual spaces, if you prefer. So W restricts to give a uh, so a global function on x plus, and also a function on x minus. And what's a function on x minus? Well, x minus is also an orbifold, right? So a function on x minus means a zd invariant function on cn. OK. So now we have two Landau-Ginzburg models, x plus with this function w or x minus with this function w. And we also have this C star equivariant Landau-Ginzburg model, where we didn't delete anything. We just work on the vector space. So I have categories of matrix factorizations for all three of these guys. So I could just work on Cn plus 1 with the function w, and I could insist on working C star equivariantly. So what does this mean? This means C star equivariant matrix factorizations, or if you prefer, curved DG sheaves. on Cn plus 1, and the curvature has to square to give the function w. Right? So it's just the same theory of matrix factorizations. Again, it's just everything in sight is, is equivariant with respect to this C star action. Um, and if you have such a thing, a matrix factorization or a, a CDG sheaf sitting on this space, you can restrict it to the open set x plus or to the open set x minus. And what will you have? You'll have a matrix factorization of the restricted function. Right? That is obvious. So it's clear that there are restriction functors from here to matrix factorizations on x plus, or alternatively, to matrix factorizations on x minus. And what's we'll matrix factorizations on x minus, that's an orbifold. So if you prefer, this is ZD equivariant matrix factorizations on Cn. And the function W, if you take the function W and restrict it to this orbifold, just think of it, where's the description? Yeah, just think of it as, as a ZD equivariant function on, on Cn. It's just, it's just the polynomial F. Right? You invert p. When you restrict to the locus x inverse, you basically ignore p, right? You set p to 1. So forget about p. You've just got f, 
F is a polynomial on CN and it's invariant under the action of ZD. So here you may as well think of the, the superpotential as just being F. Okay? So we have these three categories and these pair of functors between them. Um, this guy, by the way, as, as Nick explained, this is all of's category of graded matrix factorizations. Right? Uh, it really, when you look at it properly, it's defined on this orbifold, um, which is not a point of view that, that you'll see in all of's paper, really, but, it, but it's since become apparent. I mean, maybe none of you have read all of's paper, so you don't care, but. <laughs> okay, so this is, this is, in some sense, traditional notion of matrix factorizations. And on the other side, what do we have here? Well, we have X plus. X plus is the total space of a line bundle. And this superpotential that we've written down is of a particular form. It's just P, the fiber coordinate, times F. And F, when you think of it over here, F is a section of the OD line bundle, right? So this is exactly the example that Nick was talking about in his thing. This is tailor-made for Knorr periodicity. So this category we know from Nick's talk is, is equivalent to the derived category of the hypersurface y defined by the function f. Okay, now maybe you can, now you can start to see most of the ingredients in, in our talks coming together, right? Next talk, say, Knorr periodicity tells you how to get from an actual geometric derived category of a projective hypersurface, something very, very, you know, geometrically standard, up into some crazy category of matrix actualizations, which are defined on the total space of a, of a line bundle, right? And you were wondering why on earth you wanted to do that. The reason you wanted to do that is because now this guy admits a birational transformation. This x plus can be transformed into an x minus. So that's the benefit of doing this. Well, you know, this is a category that looked simpler and this looked harder, but why do it? You'd go up to there because when you're here, you can do a birational map that you couldn't apparently do here, right? The birational map kind of kills the, the projector space. It kills the locus y, but on a categorical level, no, it doesn't kill things. Yeah, so horizontally is a birational transformation. So the final piece of the puzzle is, is to use this window technology so that we can compare this category with this category. If I set W equals zero, we know how to do that because we've been talking about that all week. But I just need to show you how to do it when W is not zero, how to do adapt our techniques. Okay, so that's the aim. So what we want to do here is use windows to compare these categories. Now let me just point out one area of potential confusion, which I will mention and then try not to say anything about again. Um, in any Landau Ginzburg model, under the definition that, that we've been using, there is a C star action built in, which is the R charge, right? And you use it as a replacement for the sort of homological grading, right? So it sort of has this homological significance that it encodes the grading. Um, now, in that category at the top there, there are two C star actions, right? There's the C star action that I've been talking about, this thing with these weights, right, that, that is somehow you quotient by, and then there's a second C star action, which is the R charge, and you definitely don't quotient by that guy. You keep this guy and just use it for grading purposes, okay? So there are two C star actions present. Um, and consequently, when you're talking about line bundles, there are two ways to shift the gradings, right? So there's an O1 line bundle, which refers to the grading shift with respect to this guy, and that's what I've been using the whole time. And then there's an O square brackets one, which kept showing up in Nick's talk, 
and that refers to the shifting with respect to the R charge grading. Okay? So these are different grading shifts. Okay, this, this is not a deep point, it's just a thing that potentially could be confusing and I just wanted to, <laughs> probably anyone, who <laughs> probably half of you perfectly well understood that and that was useless and the other half didn't understand my explanation and are now more confused. So. <laughs> there we go. All right, anyway, that aside, um, let's get on with this. Let's try and use Windows to compare these two categories, okay? So, what did we want to do? Um, previously, we considered things which we called windows, which were subcategories generated by something like O up to O n minus 1. Okay? Um, and that makes sense sitting inside the equivariant derived category of Cn plus 1, and that was the thing that's equivalent to derived category of x plus. Right? So now I want to do it but I want to do it for matrix factorizations. And immediately you see that something a bit, a bit weird is going on. So, say I want to sit inside the category of matrix factorizations instead of the derived category. I have a problem. These things are line bundles. They are not matrix factorizations, right? You can't think of them as matrix. You can't even, you can't put the zero differential on them and think of them as matrix factorizations. D squared is not equal to W. Okay, so these are not objects inside that category, right? But let me keep this notation for a subtly different, a subtly different uh, meaning. I'm going to put quote marks about that. What could we do? Well, we could take these line bundles and we could start using them and see if we can write down any matrix factorizations that are built from these line bundles, right? So you can take direct sums of these line bundles and build high rank vector bundles. And then with those vector bundles, you can try and write down matrices which factorize W, okay? And you're gonna get some matrix factorizations in that way, but not all of them, all right? That's the category I want. That's the category I want. So when I write W now, what I mean by definition is I mean the subcategory, the full subcategory of objects curved equivariant curved DG sheaves, um, which are um, equivalent to matrix factorizations built from these line bundles. So matrix factorizations whose underlying vector bundles are direct sums of these line bundles. It is a definition which is much easier to say than to write, but hopefully that's clear, right? You build yourself all possible matrix factorizations you can, but you're only allowed those line bundles and nothing else. Um, and then technically you have to allow any object which is equivalent to one of those objects, right? That's your subcategory. That's Yes. Uh, Yes, yes it is, yes. It, it is, it's very slightly delicate because, because, the, uh, because the weights are positive and negative, um, but what saves you is that the R charge corrects for that. So yeah, it, it is true, but it takes a moment's thought to prove. Yeah. Oh, probably. But I'd possibly not actually get away without it, but yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, or yeah, if necessary, take direct sum ends of such objects. I can't remember whether that's strictly necessary. Yeah. Yes, uh, yes, yes, they would, yeah, that's right. There is, an, there is as, as has always been the case, there is always an integer worth of choices of your windows because I can set the interval of the line bundles anywhere I want. That's right. Um, Okay, so I want to prove, as before, this is equivalent to the derived category of X plus, except that it's not the derived category anymore, it's the category of matrix factorizations. So let me do it in two steps. 
I claim that if you restrict from W to matrix factorizations on X plus, that function is fully faithful. Okay? Um, and this is actually pretty easy to see. So what do you do? You take two matrix factorizations that live in my window, and I look at their HOMs. So one way to think about HOMs, particularly if your objects are actually matrix factorizations and not sheaves, is you can just take about the HOM complex, right? So this is just a chain complex, not curved anymore, but a chain complex of vector bundles, equivariant vector bundles on CN plus one. Um, Now, if I want to know, in the equivariant category, what are the homomorphisms between these two objects, I take this HOM complex, and I take its global sections, right? In principle, I would have to take derived global sections, but here, this is an affine thing, right? Global sections are just C star invariants. It's an exact functor. You just have to take invariants. So in this equivariant category, the morphisms between these two objects are given by the sections of this HOM complex. Right? Or if you like, the cohomology of that complex. So I just mean the C star invariants. Or homology of this chain complex, if you prefer. Right, but I'm going to get an equality on the level of chain complexes, so it doesn't really matter. Um, what if we go to x plus instead? So I restrict my two objects to x plus. Let me still call them E and F. Um, how do I compute the HOMs between them? Well, again, they're still actual honest matrix factorizations, not sheafy matrix factorizations. So it's the same prescription except that I have to be careful to take the derived global sections of the HOM complex. OK? Now, in principle, these two things could be different, because we know that sometimes when you restrict from CN plus 1 to X plus, then um, X groups show up, right? Cohomology can occur. So in principle, we, we, you know, if you take a random such thing and restrict to there, then perhaps higher cohomology shows up and X groups show up, and that ruins everything. But it's not going to happen because we've been careful. We've only used these line bundles. So our, all, our old window calculations could come back and just save us straight away. Right? If you think of what HOM EF looks like, HOM EF is a complex of direct sums of line bundles which lie in a specific interval, right? So they go from uh, minus n plus 1 up to n minus 1. Those are the only line bundles that can occur in this chain complex. And therefore, when you apply derived global sections, None of these guys have any derived global sections. They only have ordinary global sections. And it doesn't matter whether you compute on the whole space or on x plus, you get the same answer. OK? So those two chain complexes are on the nose the same. You don't only say they're quasi-isomorphic. They are literally identical. Right? Now, proof of claim.
Okay, so the slightly more interesting one is, is essential surge activity. And I, I don't know how much of this I want to go into, but maybe a little bit. So this restriction functor is essentially subjective. So not only an embedding of categories, but actually an equivalence, an embedding that hits everything. Right, let me, yeah, let me whip through this fairly quickly. It might not be very comprehensible. Um, the reason I want to do it is it's very closely related to a bunch of things Nick did in examples. Um, and I think by showing you a, a slightly more general argument, maybe it'll give you, well, another, another perspective. Um, so what do I have to do? I take an object, which is a matrix factorization or a curved DG sheaf living on X plus, and I have to show it's in the image of this functor. So I have to show that I can construct some thing out of these line bundles that restricts and, and equals E in this category, right? So here's how you, here's how you construct such the object. Um, so first of all, let me, just, let me just write this explicitly. What is E? It's two bits of data, right? It's a curved DG sheaf. Sorry, back that up. It's an R charge equivariant sheaf. And it's a twisted differential with the property that squares to being given, square, this differential squares to W, okay? So forget about R charge, I can't, I can't be bothered to keep track of R charge. It is, it is some sheaf with this operator D which squares to give W, right? So forget D. Forget D completely, just remember that you have a sheaf. So E is basically just the coherent sheaf on X plus. Now, we know that the set of line bundles I've written down here generates the derived category of X plus, which means that every object, in particular any sheaf on X plus, has a finite resolution by copies of these line bundles. These line models generate the derived category, so E is in their span. It is, a res it is equivalent to some complex built only out of those guys. So do that. Pick a resolution. There exists a resolution E, equivalent to E. So, oh, one another. So it's a chain complex of vector bundles resolving curly E, where every one of these guys is just the direct sum of my favorite line bundles. Okay, great, that's good, that's looking a little bit window-y, um, but it's not a matrix factorization, right? It's a chain complex. Right, let me give a name to this differential. So let me, for reasons that will become clear in a second, refer to it as D1. Okay, so D1 is the combined differential, all of the differential on these guys, all of the pieces of it. I'm going to call that D1. Um, it's not a matrix factorization, right? D1 squared is zero. So we're going to have to do some work. Um, and the claim is that you can take this differential and sort of do a perturbation, add on additional terms to this differential which means that it stops being a differential and becomes a twisted differential, and you end up with a matrix factorization. So I claim we can perturb D1 
to get a matrix factorization. And let me just show you the first few steps of that. It's a recursive procedure, but let me just show you the first few steps of how you do that. Um, we have DE, which is an endomorphism of the sheaf E, and we know that this squares the W, and now I've just replaced this curly E with a resolution. So this endomorphism of curly E has to lift to some endomorphism of the resolution. And I'm going to call that guy D0. And we know that this squares the W. What does that tell us? It tells us that the square of this guy, unfortunately, it doesn't tell us the square of this guy's W. It tells us the square of this guy is homotopic to W. Uh, this is something Nick kept, kept sort of explaining in his examples. D0 squared is... Yes, an actual chain map. Yes, and there is a, an issue there which maybe I, I will say about in one second. Um, in general, it's not true that D0 would lift to an actual map of complexes because there might be higher X groups flying around to cause trouble. R remember, we're in a window, okay? So there are no higher X groups. So we might as well imagine we're on affine space as far as we're going on, right? There are no higher X groups just because of our choice of objects. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But we're basically working with projective objects as far as, far as calculations goes. Um, okay, um, what else can we say about this guy? This is a chain map which means that it commutes with the differential that we had before. Okay, that's what being a chain map means. Um, okay, so now we said, well, the original differential was not a matrix factorization, so let's, let's do a perturbation. What if I consider D1 plus D0? And I square that guy. What do you get out? Well, D1 squared is zero, so that vanishes. The cross terms of the commutator, that comes out as zero. And what you're left with is D0 squared, which unfortunately is not equal to W yet. It's only homotopic to W. It's a super commutator, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna bother to get any signs correct in this calculation, right? <laughs> Do it yourself, or, or, or don't. <laughs> Either is fine. Okay, so we need to, we need to, we need to go deeper into the, into the process, right? D0 squared is homotopic to W. So this is the bit that, that Nick was doing. Pick the homotopy, okay? It's homotopic to zero, so pick, it's homotopic to W, so pick a homotopy. There exists a D minus one, which is a map from this complex to itself, such that the commutator of D one and D minus one is the difference between D zero squared and W times the identity. D minus one is the chain homotopy. This thing is what happens when you take the boundary of a homotopy. You take its commutator with the differential, okay? Um, thank you, D minus one is the homotopy. D one is the original differential. Yeah, if you're wondering what my indices refer to, 
They refer to your gr the grading of these maps, but nothing to do with R charge, just the grading as, as written on the board here, right? D1 goes one step to the right. D0 is a chain map, it goes no steps to right or left. D minus one is a homotopy, it goes backwards one step, okay? So di has degree i uh, <laughs> with respect to what grading? I can't write that down. <laughs> Not it's right. The point is, we've just for the for the moment we've completely forgotten our charge, and we're just using the ordinary notion of homological grading in the derived category. That's that's what we're doing. Okay. So now we do what Nick did, is which is to take d1 and d0 and the homotopy as well, and see if we get a matrix factorization yet. Okay, what do I get? Well, the first two terms squaring together give me D0 squared, and then what's left? Well, I get the commutator of D1 and D minus one, so that gives me this term here, which if you get the signs right, you know, cancels out. Let me just throw in minus signs at random. Um, and so those two cancel each other out, which is nice. And then you, you haven't finished, right? You, you've left with something else, which is, um, which is d minus one squared, right? That's the term I haven't included, I think, unless I've made a mistake. Now, in one of Nick's examples, the homotopy squared to zero, and that term was zero, and he could stop. And I think in, one, in your other example, it didn't square to zero, is that right? or the example you set them or something. Yeah. Anyway, this, in, sometimes you're lucky that goes to zero, but there's no reason to assume it goes to zero in general, right? Um, but on the other hand, this thing at least has now degree minus two. So I could think of this as W plus lower order terms. Um, and I claim that you can just keep going. You can keep solving this problem throwing in differentials of, of more and more negative degree. Um, and of course, the thing was only finite. So at some point, this process bottoms out, and you actually end up with a matrix factorization. So at the end of the day, you get a matrix factorization built out. It's, so it's, its underlying vector bundle is the thing that's on the board over there. And it has some differential that we've just constructed recursively. And the square of the differential is genuinely on the nose equal to W. Okay? And then you have to prove that the thing you've just constructed is isomorphic to your original matrix factorization that you had. So you want to prove that this thing is equivalent to your curved DG sheaf that you started with. And how do you do that? Well, you've kind of seen some of the flavor of those calculations in Nick's talk, right? You, you saw things where you Kuzul resolved, you perturbed the differential, and then he showed you how to prove that it was equivalent to the original thing. So use those ideas. All right, and then you're done. You have constructed a thing which is in the image of the window. Right? This thing lives in the image of the restriction functor because it's built out of the line bundles that I needed it to be built out of. Yes, I knew I was being too optimistic. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. That's right. Yeah. I knew I'd miss something. <laughs> okay, great. Right. We're done, basically. If I go back to my diagram on the, uh, on the upper central board up there, we're ready to roll. So what I proved is that 
the restriction functor from my window um, gives an equivalence to the matrix factorizations on x plus. So you have to do x minus as well, but we've saw before, you know, it's all the same game. Uh, these arguments were just run through again. Um, you just have to get the size of the window correct, right? So window prime is going to be the same definition, but with a different number of line bundles. And this window prime is equivalent to matrix factorizations on x minus. Oh, hang on, I didn't finish that sentence. <laughs> this restriction functor is an equivalence. If you use this window prime instead, it's an equivalence to x minus. Okay, and again, this is an abuse of notation. These objects, these line bundles are not objects in this category, but what I mean is all the thing I said before about you build matrix factorizations out of those guys, right? Okay, great. Now, by the way that we built the story, one of these guys fits inside the other one. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Yeah, exactly, exactly. They're chain maps, is the first statement, and they're zero in, in X groups. Yeah, and then you keep going. <laughs> okay. So we proved all of this theorem. Let me do it here, because that diagram is kind of handy to refer to. So this is a theorem which is due to Orloff uh, in a very interesting paper. Um, the proof that I've just given you is completely different to his proof. Um, I like this one more. But I'm probably biased. Um, I welcome you, to, you know, I urge you to go and read his paper and compare methods. His proof is much shorter. Completely different proof. Um, you know, what have we proved? If n is bigger than d, then matrix factorizations on x minus, so zd equivariant matrix factorizations on cn of the function f embeds into matrix factorizations on x plus. And that, by Knorr periodicity, is the derived category of our projective hyperservice. If n is less than d, then the embedding goes the other way. If n is equal to d, then the two categories are equivalent. n equals d is the case that the hypersurface is anti-canonical and is a clobby out. Um, the top one is the case of hypersurfaces of um, low degree, right? D is only allowed to go up as far as the ambient dimension and no further. So these guys are Farnos, right? I had a moment of worry about, are they always Farnos? <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so here they're general type, right? Uh, 
Okay, so, you know, this is kind of fun. But if you have a Fano variety, then if it's, at least if it's a hypersurface, you have discovered that there's sort of an interesting piece inside its derived category which has a pretty different description in terms of matrix factorizations. And it makes you think, well, maybe if it's not a, what if it's a different kind of Fano? Maybe you should still play the same game and look for interesting subcategories and, and you'd be correct. Um, if it's Calabi Yao, you get an even better statement, which is the whole derived category is, has this alternative description in terms of matrix factorizations. General type is slightly less useful because it just says you can embed it into some other category. Well, you know, you can embed into enormous categories, so. In some sense, in some sense, that's the most interesting. That's pretty cool and that's maybe not so interesting, but. Um, it's a Calabi Yao hypersurface in projective space. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, right, so. Right, cool, okay, thank you, yes. Yeah, I guess what I, what I haven't said yet, which I probably should, is that my comment earlier about you know, when we didn't have W, I said one category sits inside the other as an admissible subcategory, the orthogonal has an exceptional collection, it's still true, right? So it's still true that the perpendicular has a full exceptional collection. In both cases. Yeah, in fact, from the point of view of the theorem, it doesn't, it look, the, the thing looks entirely symmetric. Apart from these, until you apply Knorr periodicity, it looks entirely symmetric. You does not really care which side is which. And you can write down generalizations where, you know, you can't tell which side is which. <laughs> they look the same. So yeah, let me, let me do some, put some numbers in and do some concrete examples. just to make it feel a little more real. We've got loads of time. Man, I'm not even gonna ever run. I'll tell you loads of stuff. Okay, what's the simplest non-trivial example? What if I set N and D to be equal and both equal to three? Right, what's that? That's a calabi yau hypersurface in P2, also known as an elliptic curve. It's a cubic curve, right? Elliptic curve in P2. And the theorem says that the derived category of Y, which is a reasonably interesting object, has a completely different description in terms of matrix factorizations Z3 equivariantly on the space C3 of the function f, where f is the cubic that cut out y. Okay? Um, that is basically the example that Nick keeps using, right? He would doing, yeah. So all this discussion about, you know, sheaves on elliptic curves and push turning them to matrix factorizations, right? This is, this is the categorical statement that he was driving at. Um, you could just up the dimension. You could take n equals d equals four. Y is a k three. You get the same thing again. You could say n equals d equals five, which is cute only because y is then a quintic threefold. And if you're a string theorist, you know you're totally obsessed with quintic threefolds. So. Um, in, in the physics literature, by the way, this, this thing is called the calabi yau landau ginzburg correspondence. We're going from a calabi yau hypersurface to a landau ginzburg model. And it is actually a reflection of something that doesn't just, it's not just a statement about categories, it's really a statement about um, conformal field theory, and it's very, very much harder. And I don't, I don't think it's proved in any sense on the level of conformal field theory. And sometimes we're just exploring a tiny little corner of, of what string theory is really saying here. We're doing topological string theory, which is much easier than actual real string theory. <laughs> um, 
Um, yeah. C3, it's acting diagonally by cube root of unity. Right, you just act on every coordinate by some primitive cube root of unity. Right, and then a cubic function would be invariant under that action. Uh, yes, yeah, that's right. Um, let me do a final example to make contact with what Nick yelled from the side. Um, uh, in fact, let's just do a quadric. So let me say d equals 2, but n can be anything you like. What does that say? It says y is a quadric hypersurface. You know, so in low dimensions, it would be a rational curve, or it would be a p1 cross p1, or so forth. Um, because this is low degree, the derived category of Y has a copy of the matrix factorization category sitting inside it. So if you want to look, know about the derived category of Y, you know that it contains some exceptional objects, and then it also contains something which could be more interesting, which is matrix factorizations taken Z2 equivariantly of uh, the quadric F. So this thing equals that plus some exceptional objects, except that actually that's not that interesting either, because what I've got here is matrix factorizations of a quadratic form. Now you've been hearing all about canary periodicity, which is all about matrix factorizations of a quadratic form. And what it says is that there aren't very many of them. Basically, you should think that that's the derived category of a point. That category should be generated by a single exceptional object. Right? That's what Nick was proving this morning. Yeah, exactly. So the minor correction is that you have to remember about the Z2 action. Right? There are two irreducible representations of Z2, and that means that you don't get one point, you get two points, except slightly confusingly, you do only get one point in odd dimension. So there are two, there are two possibilities. Um, if n is even, this is equal to the derived category of two points. And if n is odd, it's equal to the derived category of one point. And the reason there are two points there is because there's two irreps of the Orbifold group Z2. And the reason those two points become one is just because the two choices end up being isomorphic in odd dimension, and they fail to be isomorphic in even dimension. Sorry? No. <laughs> you know, there are a lot of Z2s in, in flying around in this sort of discussion, and that's not the Z2 of the Brat, is that right? It's not, yeah. You don't think so. <laughs> yeah, we don't, we, I don't think that's the Brat group. Um, it is also with Clifford algebras. If you know about Clifford algebras, they behave differently in odd and even dimension. That's, that's what's happening. And another reasonable question you could ask is, okay, so this category has an exceptional collection, right? Consisting of either one object or two objects, and that's sitting inside there, so what are the objects? What are those exceptional objects? And the answer is they're spinner bundles. Did Nick say that? I'm gonna ask you guys. <laughs> no, he didn't even say it, okay. Well, the answer is they go to spinner bundles. You said it, but you didn't write it, fine. None of them listened. Right. So these two, this choice of point, one point or two point, what they map to is spinner bundles on the quadric. And then you've got some, uh, some other exceptional objects, which just the line bundles coming from the ambient. Uh, oh, yeah, one more cool example. 
Uh, let me say n equals 6, d equals 3. Uh, so y is a cubic threefold. No, it's not. It's a cubic fourfold inside p5. You mentioned this guy last week as well? Yeah? Ish, in passing. OK. This may have been mentioned in passing last week. The lecturer can't remember. Um, we have this cubic fourfold. Again, this is, this is low degree, right? It's only a cubic, but it's sitting inside P5. So we should look for an interesting subcategory inside it. So matrix factorizations taken Z3 equivariantly on C6 of the cubic sit inside the derived category of your cubic. And they constitute the interesting bit of its derived category. The remainder is just exceptional objects. Now, this is particularly cool because this guy is Calabi Yau. Why is it Calabi Yau? Because if you think about Z3 acting on the determinant of C6, it is trivial. I, earlier, I convinced you that Zn acting on Cn is Calabi Yau because the determinant is trivial. But if I take Z3 and act on C6, the determinant is still trivial, right? Yeah, Z6 would be acting trivially, so Z3 is also acting trivially. Um, so you should think of, of the orbifold C6 mod Z3 is calabi -Yau. And what's actually precisely true is that this, sub, this category here of matrix factorizations has a trivial Sayer functor. Well, it's a shift, right? When you're Calabi L, the Sayer functor is not the identity, it's a shift. And you have to stare at it a little bit to work out what the correct shift is. It's shift by 2. I don't claim that's obvious. Um, the shift by 2 comes from some combination of the dimension you're in, and then you have to do a correction because of R charge. Right, R charge is all about homological shift. So this 2 is, is like dimension plus R charge in some slightly non-obvious way. But that is the answer. OK. Now, do you know a category which has a surf functor which is shift by 2? Yes, the derived category of a K3 surface. K3 surface has trivial canonical bundle. It's two-dimensional, so its surf functor is shift by 2. So this subcategory inside this cubic fourfold looks like a K3 category, like the derived category of a K3 surface. Um, if you work hard at compute its Hochschild homology and its Hochschild cohomology and its K-theory and blah, 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 it looks like a K-3, right? But it's not a K-3. It's not the derived category of a K-3. It's a category which has that property, unless you choose your cubics very carefully. So for very, some very special choices of cubics, it actually is a K-3 surface. You can find the K-3 surface that it comes from. But the moduli space of cubics is bigger than the moduli space of K-3s. So this tells us there's a moduli space of K3 categories, which contains the actual geometric K3s inside it as, as a sublocus. And here is one construction of such K3 categories, but not all of them. So that's pretty fun. Right, I'm, yeah, I'm going to take my last 10 minutes, and I'm going to do a more complicated example, um, which will, yeah, will involve a couple of things which I haven't said yet. So it may or may not make sense.
So we've been entirely talking, at least in my talk, about hypersurfaces, right? But Nick proved canary periodicity for complete intersections, not just hypersurfaces. So let's use that. Let's set up a situation where we can use canary periodicity to access a complete intersection and not just the hypersurface. And fortunately, we can do that using one of, using an example of, of the form we've already seen loads of times. What if I let C star act on CM plus two with a bunch of weights one and then two negative weights? Now I'm going to make my negative weights be minus two and minus two. So this is similar to examples I did before, but before I just did one, 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 and then minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, right? So this is not quite the same, but it looks pretty similar. Um, let me give these variables names. So the first positive variables are going to be called x. The last two variables are going to be called p and q. Um, and if you care, the r charges are 0, 0, 0, 0, 2, 2. Um, OK, so that set up my equivariant thing. Now I need to pick a superpotential. So here's how I do my superpotential. I pick two quadratic forms in the x variables. And to get w, you consider p times f plus q times g. Hopefully it looks familiar from Nick's discussion of canary periodicity. That's our equivariant situation. Now let's go to the quotients. So there are two possible quotients, as we know. One of them is defined by taking out the set where x goes to 0 and quotienting. And we know what that is. It's the total space of O minus 2 twice over the projective space in the x coordinates. So this is a rank 2 vector bundle over projective space. I've equipped it with a superpotential of a, a very specific form. It's p times f plus q times g. And it feeds into canary periodicity, and you get that the derived category of ma well, matrix factorizations on this guy is the derived category of y, where y is the codimension 2 thing cut out by f and g. So y is the set where f and g are 0, the intersection of two quadrics in projective space. You could, of course, do the intersection of three quadrics or four quadrics or five quadrics by the same method. What about the other quotient? This is, this is where um, some of you will, will begin to hate me. Um, let me take out the locus where p and q equals 0. Now, in our previous examples, that just gave us, again, a, a vector bundle over projective space, right? But now, unfortunately, our, our C star action is acting with weight 2 on these two variables. So it's not ordinary projective space. It's not P1. It's weighted P1. Weighted P1, where you've done the bizarre thing of choosing the weights to be the same. Right? Normally, you might think of weighted P1 with like weights 1, 2 or something. But I'm going to choose weight 2, 2. So this is the total space of the line bundle O minus 1 to the n sitting over weighted projective space. And if you don't know what that means, I'm sorry. I'll talk, I'm happy to explain it later on. So a good way to think about what this object is, it's a bundle living over ordinary projective space. But the fibers of this bundle are orbifolds.
But you see, at every point in ordinary projective space, there's a Z2 isotropy group, and it's acting non-trivially on the fibers. It's acting by rotating the fibers. So the fibers are just copies of Cn with an action of Z2. Okay? So we have this space, and it has a superpotential on it, right? It has the superpotential W equals PF plus QG. So what does the superpotential look like? If you fix a point in the base, the superpotential is just the quadratic form. Right, you fix the values of P and Q, I've got a single quadratic form. Right, so now I'm taking the point of view that I have a pencil of, of quadrics, right? I'm just varying the parameters P and Q and getting a family of, of quadratic forms. OK, so now, in this more complicated example, what we've got on the x minus side um, is something that physicists call a hybrid model. They wouldn't call it a Landau-Ginzburg model. They'd probably call it a hybrid model. Because each fiber is a, a Landau-Ginzburg model of the form we're, we've been sort of talking about. It's just Cn mod Zd with some, with some quadratic on it, right? But I have to sit those fibers together into a family over P1. It's a family of Landau Ginzburg models, so they, they call it a hybrid model. Um, so we get, using windows, we get a comparison, an equivalence or, or a semi orthogonal decomposition. between the derived category of this co-dimension two thing, this intersection of two quadrics, and this maybe slightly crazy looking thing, which is a hybrid model. So matrix factorizations on x minus. OK? And depending on the numbers, you'll get an embedding one way or the other. Right? But now let me point out that this thing is not so, not so weird after all, actually, because the fibers are really easy. If you want to know what's, what's matrix factorizations on one of these fibers, well, it's just Cn mod Z2 with a W being a quadratic. And now Knorr periodicity kicks in again, right? This, using Knorr periodicity, this is just equivalent to the drive category of either one point or two points, depending on whether you're odd or even. Right, so let me just say we're in the even case. This will be the derived category of two points. So what does this hybrid model look like? It's a family of categories over projective space, and at every point in projective space, you have two points. So it looks like a double cover of projective space, right? And it absolutely is a double cover of projective space, except there's one issue which is Knorr periodicity works for non-degenerate quadratic forms. And there will be a locus where this guy becomes degenerate, discriminant locus. When it becomes degenerate, you have to do a little more calculation. You discover the two points collide with each other and the double cover ramifies. Right? The derived category of this hybrid model, which is related to the derived category of the intersection of quadrics, is equivalent to a ramified DB of a ramified double cover of P1. And there's no Brouwer class, right? I haven't got enough quadrics to get a Brouwer class. Fine. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a hyperelliptic curve. Um, you can try and do it, what I was muttering to Nick about is you can try and do it for more quadrics, intersect a whole load of quadrics, and play this game again. You'll get a ramified double cover of PK, right? Um, then Brouwer classes come in and cause you headaches. Um, and this is no longer true. You have to twist the derived category by some gerb. 
But anyway, that's way beyond <laughs> what we need to talk about. Okay, I'll stop. Thank you very much.